This is part number four of something that we have entitled a blueprint of God's eternal purpose. And what we have tried to do with this particular graphic is bring together everything that the Bible says with regard to eternity future. Now, we know that the name of eternity future is the dispensation of the fullness of times. It is a time whenever God is going to erase every vestige of the past and of the old, and he is out of the old going to bring in creatures made new. He will refurbish the earth, and then he is going to have a, once again his kingdom. And that's why the very first um, thing on our chart is the kingdom of God. And we've come to understand that as more or less like the United States of America as a federal government over all of the land. We, in actuality, only have one government for America. But now, there are delegated authorities to locally dispense that government in, uh, in the various areas of America, states, counties, uh, communities, and so forth. But like the United States, the kingdom of God is one kingdom that rules over all. Now, this is an important kingdom because you have to be born again to enter it. You can't see it. You can't be part of it. Uh, you'll never participate in it unless you have trust of the Lord as your Savior and become part of that kingdom through faith. You're a citizen. But also, the second thing we noted was that God has a household. Now, this is real important because for some reason, People do not understand actually what a dispensation is and what the whole issue is about. The issue is about control and government. Who is going to have the ultimate say about what goes and what doesn't go? So not only does God have a kingdom with citizens, he also has a household with family members. But in the ancient times, you have to remember that a householder had a steward, and a steward was in charge with the revelation of the laws of the householder, and he was the one who told the children of the house and the servants of the house where to go and what to do. Now, I'm saying where to go in the proper way there, but uh, he would assign to them their duties, their uh, uh, apportionment uh, uh, of supper and, and uh, their chores and the like. Now, you and I, as members of the body of Christ, are part of the kingdom. We've been born again, and we're part of God's household. Now, remember that Paul deals in second, or excuse me, the, the second chapter of Ephesians with the fact that he is bringing together a household where we're all going to live together. Now, the distinction is this. The brown colors here talk about God's household on earth. This has to do with a nation and a race of people called Israel. And Gentile peoples, as they are related to them religiously and regenerationally, Gentiles having believed in the God of Israel. So the, the brown colors here talk about God's household on earth. But the fact of the matter is, God has a bigger household in space. Now, I know that many of you are not Trekkie fans, and I probably could never interest you in becoming a Trekkie fan uh, because of some of the outlandish things and so forth. But I want to tell you, it's not all that outlandish. There is life on other planets, and some of the things that they present to us by means of their graphics, and boy, wouldn't I like to have a budget <laughs> like Star Trek for some graphics. That would be fantastic, but we have to do with what we have. But the point that I'm making is that throughout the universe, there are dominions with thrones, seats of government that are like the earth, but are, are vaster uh, as far as scope is concerned. And so the blue indicates that God is forming a family, which will he will seat upon all of the thrones and they will rule over the universe forever. That family is called the church. And anybody born from Paul to the born again from Paul to the rapture is part of the church and will rule in the heavens. And that, of course, is the blue colors here. But now, 
Before we started looking into that aspect of this graphic, we also noted something else. That God has some good news for us. In eternity past, he thought about us. How do we know he thought about us? I'll tell you how I know. And it's something we've taught here just recently. There is a book of bodily appointments, which simply means that God sat down and said, there, are, there is a certain type of person that I want alive at a certain time in history. And he wrote down what that person would look like, whether it be a male or a female, hair color, eye color, size, and so forth. It's all there in the book of bodily appointments. Now, I also know that he thought of me through the book of the living. After all, I am alive. You are looking at somebody who is breathing. Uh, we're, we're in technicolor here, and, uh, and uh, the uh, communication is live on the spot. And the book of the living says that, that God, in eternity past, according to the book of bodily appointments, gave birth to someone, you can put your name in there, to live at a certain time in history. And that during that certain time in history, they would be given an option to either place their name in the book of life or to have it blotted out. Now, whether or not you're in the book of life depends upon your believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you are obviously written in the other two books of God's decrees. Now, what is that? That's good news. That means that God decided to create. He doesn't want to damn us. He doesn't want to condemn us. He didn't make us for the express purpose of putting us in hell. He made us for the purpose of loving him and so that he could love us in return. We just sang the song, Jesus loves the little, little children. That's the good news of God. So God has given us a gospel. And you'll note as it is in the chart here, it is the foundational gospel. You cannot find any other message of good news in this whole chart that is not based upon or rooted in this gospel of God. Now, the next gospel we're going to talk about, and we've already done so just briefly in part three, is called the gospel of peace. And we just touched on this last Sunday night. So what we're going to do from here on out until we exhaust these various gospels is go up the center portion, which as you can tell, is in the shape of a cross. Now why do we do that? Because ultimately these gospels, based on the gospel of God, are the ones that number one, activate the gospel of God on our behalf. Without the blood of Christ, the gospel of his son dying on the cross, no one would have salvation. But that uh, that these things are also something that we hold in common. What do I mean by that? Simply this. The same blood of the new covenant that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary is the same blood of the new covenant that covers your sins and mine eternally. There are not two different covenants for the remission of sins forever. Only one. Israel was given the covenant by virtue of an oath. We were given the covenant by virtue of the grace of God. Not the whole covenant, just the part of the new covenant that saves us and gives us the Holy Spirit forever. So the ones in red are the gospels that both of us share together. They contain the messages that save us not only save the sinner, but what the saint then is saved to. Isaiah chapter 57. Verse number 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Now remember, there's a whole lot of talk about peace today. That somehow the United Nations is going to have enough power to put pressure on the whole nations of the world to have peace. We've seen that that has failed because Jesus said there's going to be wars and rumors of war till he comes back. 
The United Nation can never bring in global peace, though they are arrogant enough to think that they can. Fine. But God has a message of peace. But if you reject his message, you are wicked. Verse 20. But the wicked. Now, in your text, you see that it is the Hebrew rasha. What does wicked mean? Rasha means one guilty of a crime. What is the worst crime in all of the universe? Unbelief in Jesus Christ. And here's where a lot of people go wrong. They look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, I've never murdered. I don't cut down my neighbor and so forth. Yes, but if you do not believe on Christ, that is the reason Lucifer is cast into the lake of fire. He rebelled against Christ. He said he's not worthy to rule in my life and to be my Lord. That is a crime. It is a cosmic, galactic crime worthy of being barred from the universe forever. Now that's the type of crime that this person, the wicked one, has uh, committed. They are like a troubled sea. It cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Now, we should be from, uh, uh, very familiar with this. We've just had some sort of spill that has caused us to have to boil uh, water. We cannot drink it because there's something bad inside that can make us sick. But as far as God is concerned, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Why? Because they're always stirring up trouble. God says, I want to have peace with you. And they say, no, that is an act of rebellion against the sovereignty of God and, uh, and his king, Jesus Christ. And that is a crime worthy of eternal death. Chapter 59 of Isaiah, verse 8. Now, it says, the way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. In other words, they constantly make wrong decisions. Though they may make certain right decisions about their life and career and might make a success of themselves, technically every decision they make is evil. It is to get the best of life apart from God and leave him out. So whatever decisions they make just simply goes to further their and uh, complicate their problems and life. To become entangled with this world, did not the Lord say, uh, there will be those who will be choked with the riches of this world. They want this world rather than the, and its riches rather than God and his. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Now, here, here's where we come to the uh, modern day uh, New Age meditation, uh, meditative techniques, to find yourself, to find peace with yourself. How many times you hear this? Uh, celebrities uh, will say that. I saw last night there was a the thing on the, the news where the fella who used to, um, he was a, he's a, a black fella who used to play in that thing, the star in Miami Vice. It's something Michael Thomas or whatever. And he got on and I, and I looked because I was watching the news and I hadn't seen this fella for a long time. I wonder, well, what's he doing on the air again? And uh, he told us what he was doing. He has started the Something Michael Thomas International Psychic Hotline. Here again is another one. We've got uh, Dionne Warwick. We, we've got uh, how many others? Investing time and money to find peace with themselves by collaborating with demons. Because that's what they are. They're either fakers or they're demon-possessed, either or. But uh, to pay good money to promote such nonsense is, uh, is ridiculous. But there again, he's popular, he's good-looking, he's wealthy, he wants to make more money, he's influential, and he is offering this service to others as a come-on to find success. And the, and the very first thing is, is this uh, very good-looking black girl. She comes behind uh, the, the two people sitting there in his audience and says, Boy, this is great. I, I no sooner called. Uh, that number, and I found the you know the love of my life. And then somebody else came on there and said, "Yes, I no sooner called that number than my psychic told me exactly where to find a job, and I've got the career and you know of a lifetime and so forth." And blah blah on and on and uh, ad nauseum, uh, because that is all it is. 
God says you will not find peace. Yes, you might have temporary peace with yourself uh, superficially, but there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And people who constantly make decisions against Christ in their life uh, have no peace. Now why? Psalm 7. Psalms 7. And verse number 11. God judges the righteous, but God is angry with the wicked every day. So we find that God is definitely displeased with people who constantly reject his son as savior and his lifestyle as uh, the foremost lifestyle in their lives. Okay, let's turn now to 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be here and then in Romans and then we'll move on. But we go here because, and this is the um, little illustration that I showed on Sunday evening. Between God and man, there is an irrevocable barrier as far as man is concerned. Man can do nothing to tear down the barrier between himself and God. It doesn't matter if he tries to be good. It doesn't matter if he's good to his neighbor. It, it just does not matter. He was born wrong the first time. And he was born into a world unborn as far as the family of God is concerned. That's the second barrier. A third barrier is that he has sins that are multiplying, uh, accruing, now, on and on, he has sins that pose a problem between himself and God, and he has no means to atone for those sins. Unless God acts on his behalf, man is doomed to hell. Now, the gospel of peace is this, good news. God has taken the initiative. God wants to do something for man. God wants to have a relationship with man, and so here's what God has done. He, in effect, took all of man's sins and everything involving that barrier, and he judged them on the cross of Calvary. So that now there is nothing left but one thing between himself and man, and that's man's own volition. Everything else is removed. Only God could do such a thing to remove everything in the barrier and say, that's peace. Now, let's read some verses here. Verse number 18 in 2 Corinthians 5. All things are of God, who has reconciled uh, us to himself by Jesus Christ, and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I want you to understand that there is both a potential and an actual reconciliation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the potential is this. Everything was done on God's part to be reconciled. Every sin was judged, every barrier removed. So God says to man, look, I will I'll put down my weapon. I'll quit being angry with you. I'll put down my weapon and extend the hand of peace to the point of the cross. That's potential reconciliation. Total reconciliation or actual reconciliation is when man, and this is something you did, you had potential reconciliation, but you could have been wicked. God is angry with the wicked every day. You could have said, well, God, maybe, well, no, I'm going to refuse the right hand of fellowship with you. I won't be reconciled. That's fine. You are still under the condemnation of God. But the moment you extend that hand of faith and Join uh, that with God's at the cross. You are saved, and that's by grace through faith. Grace says that God did all the work. Faith says, I believe it and claim it as mine by grasping the hand of God at the cross. 
So by grace through faith you are saved. But reconciliation means that God has moved toward man to the point of the cross. Total reconciliation is that man has taken that by faith and moved toward God to the point of the cross. Now they're at one. So let's read. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's potential reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. In other words, today, God is not simply telling man to do this. He has committed it to other men to tell men to be reconciled to God. Verse 20, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're ministers of reconciliation. Now, here's, here's something for you ladies. We do not believe in, in female preachers, excuse the phrase, but we do believe that the ladies are ministers, ministers of reconciliation, on a total uh, equal footing with the man. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you are spirit-filled, God has committed to you the ministry of reconciliation and you can minister. The problem is uh, we have uh, too many ladies who want to be behind the pulpit and too many ladies who don't want to be ministers of reconciliation. Your actual ministry is that of reconciliation. What is that? As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Now you stand on this side and extend the right hand of fellowship and say, look, I'm the representative of God, but I can only do so much. I can only go halfway to the point of the cross. You must, in order to be reconciled to God, believe in his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross. The one is mere potential, the other is actual. What does it say? We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right, now Romans chapter 5. And verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith, we take what God did by his grace at the cross, and we are justified. What do we have? Peace. That's the message of peace. That God has laid down his, his weapons, and he will become one with you. He will sign a peace pact with you forever if you will lay down your weapons and believe on his son. Verse 6, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's the potential reconciliation. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Peradventure for a good man would some dare to die. But God commends his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He provided a potential for us at the cross, whether or not we would accept it. He still did it. That's the good news of peace. He laid down his weapons. He removed the barrier that, of, of opposition, and that's peace. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, will be saved from wrath through him. For if we were, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's potential. Much more being reconciled, that's actual. We shall be saved forever, in other words, by his life. So the gospel of peace is a fantastic thing. And it's fantastic because not only do you have peace with God the moment you believed, but you get to be an ambassador of reconciliation telling others about this peace. All right, let's move on. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is added to a transaction, a chemical solution, where the catalyst itself does not change, but because of the addition of this, it changes the overall composition 
of the solution. The next gospel that we want to talk about, the gospel of Christ, is such a catalyst. It is an activator. Everything else might be in its place, but without this addition, nothing else would work. It could not be what it's supposed to be. Now, what is that gospel? It's known as the gospel of Christ. And it actually uh, comes to us in uh, chapter 1 from the pen of the Apostle Paul, verse number 16. All right. Paul says, and these are some verses, by the way, that perhaps uh, if you've never committed them to memory, you should. Because it has to do with uh, what saves you, the object of your faith, and it has to do also with the dispensational uh, allowance of or dispensing of this faith. What do I mean? Let's look. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it's the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's grace provides to a, to a certain point, and man enters into it by faith. But we live in the dispensations after the cross, so that simply means that we do not place our faith in something that is a type of Christ, the lamb, or whatever. Something that is a type of Christ. Noah's Ark is a type of Christ. Being inside protects us from the danger. But we actually place our faith in Christ himself. Now, let's, uh, let's just take a peek at that here a minute. It's another little chart. All right? In the dispensation of grace, especially, the cross and the Christ of the cross become the object of salvation. Now, why is this important? Well, let's go back uh, once again to um, pre prevailing thinking. Here's God up here, okay? What do religions say to believe in God do we say that well yes in essence we do but what we say is that this is the record that God hath given us life and this life is in his son he that has the son has life he that has not the son of God hath not life. Once Christ died upon the cross, once the dispensation of grace especially was ushered in, the object of salvation is not simply faith in God, though that's true. We believe the record that God has given of his son. But what has God commanded us to believe in, or who has God commanded us to believe in, in order to be saved? His son. Now that's an important point. Why? Well, don't uh, the Buddhists believe in a God? Are they saved? No, because they reject Christ. What about the Hindus? Well, sure, they believe in Vishnu and a whole lot of others, but they don't believe in Christ. On and on we could go, as long as the religion simply points people to a God and bypasses the Christ of the cross, those people are not saved. They're not saved. They're wicked and blasphemous. But then again, here come the, the uh, New Agers, and they say, believe in man. Just believe in yourself. Now, I'm going to say something here uh, with regard to even some programs uh, that, uh, that are supposed to help people. We've talked about this before, and I've, I've been asked this question. Is saying, just believe in yourself, or is saying you'll have a healthier lifestyle if you believe in a God, is that 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not. It's blasphemous. The minute you believe in yourself and you detract from the total sufficiency of the cross, you are in dire straits with God, let me tell you. And the minute you bypass, the, the book of James says, the devils believe in God and tremble. Simply meaning that God wants us to focus our faith and attention on the person of his son. That's how you get saved. And that's what the gospel of Christ is. Uh, and uh, by the way, it is not good news if you don't believe. It's good news that he died for you, but it's not good news if you do not believe and you reject him. Okay? We have just a few minutes here. Let's, uh, let's go to the book of John, chapter 3, verse 18. So the gospel of Christ gives us its, its object. The object of what? Salvation. What you're to believe in. You know, there are programs that have a, you know, there are 12 steps, and one of the steps is to believe in, believe in a God. Well, I want to tell you that to present to a person a false gospel simply to get him to... Uh, 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 get on the wagon and, and, and so forth uh, to clean up his life is still dirtying his life. You cannot tell somebody a false gospel under the, under the uh, uh, presupposition that they are going to write a new book, turn over a new leaf, when all they are doing is changing one God, the bottle, to another God themselves in order to by sheer grit and determination uh, save themselves from drink. That's nonsense. You must believe in Christ to be saved. Period. Over and out. All right. John chapter 3, verse number 18. What does believing in Christ save you from? It has three aspects salvation does. One from the penalty of sin, that's past. One from the power of sin that is present. One from the presence of sin that is future. So let's just mark in the tenses here. Past, present, and future. Make reference to the first one, and then we'll close for this hour. The penalty of sin, spiritual death, verse 18. He that believes on him is not condemned. He that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, mind you, this verse is specific. You must believe in the person of Christ, not in a God and not in yourself and not in some uh, so-called self-help group. It is, it is Christ alone, and he's the one who, first of all, saves you from the penalty of sin. Verse 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The penalty of the original sin was spiritual death. You cannot duplicate it, but you can perpetuate it simply by unbelief. If you choose not to believe in Christ, the penalty remains the same. Even though all other barriers are removed, there's one barrier that was not removed until you believe, and that is the penalty of spiritual death. That is a past tense. Once you believe, the penalty is removed forever. 